In this video lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more about the kernel. We'll look at where the kernel actually resides on your system, where the kernel modules reside on the system, talk a little more, bit more about what makes the Linux kernel the Linux kernel, in other words, what's its role in the system. And then we'll go ahead and we'll actually download uh, the source code for the Linux kernel, take a look at it, and um, look at the different options that can be configured within the Linux kernel. The goal here is not to give you the ability to compile your own custom kernel. Instead, it's just to give you a little bit more information about what this really important piece of the operating system does. I mean, the reason it's called Linux is because it uses the Linux kernel. So um, let's take a look at a couple of things. First things first, what is the Linux kernel? Well, according to Wikipedia, the Linux kernel is a computer program that manages input output requests from software and translates them into data processing instructions for the CPU and other electronic components of a computer. In other words, I always like to think of the kernel kind of as the, um, you know, the director of everything at the lowest level. And um, it handles um, talking to the hardware and it knows how to um, communicate with, you know, uh, expansion cards and it knows how to time slice on the CPU and kind of manage all your system resources. Uh, it does all of the grunt work under the hood so that you can do the fun stuff in user space with the applications that you run. So it's really, again, the lowest level part of our computer that allows us to interact with uh, and utilize the hardware that we have available. Where does the kernel actually sit? If you watched uh, my video lecture a little bit on how the uh, computer goes into a, a boot from pressing the power button all the way up to a command prompt, uh, we talked a little bit about it is the bootloader's job to go ahead and load the Linux kernel. So I'm going to go into a directory on the Linux system called uh, slash boot. And if I take a look at what's in this uh, directory, you're going to see a couple of things. Um, but the one that's most important, or in this case, I actually have two kernels on my system, uh, are these items that are called VM Linux. And these are actually the system kernels. Uh, there's a bunch of other files around here that are useful with, with booting the system, but the actual uh, compiled kernels are these two files here. And you'll notice that it's possible to have multiple kernels on a system. In this case, uh, I guess in case the uh, the update goes bad, you can always revert to the old known best um, kernel. Sometimes you might have a, a specialized kernel for testing and you may want to boot into that testing kernel. Maybe you have a, a, an older piece of hardware that only works with an older piece of, or sorry, an older Linux kernel and you might want to keep that older kernel around. Um, how do you select or choose to boot into uh, one kernel over another? That's a little beyond the, beyond the scope of this uh, video lecture, but you would actually configure that utilizing your system's bootloader. And in this case, on Ubuntu, it uses Grub2. And um, at the time your system boots, um, just like you can choose to boot into, say, single user mode or recovery mode, uh, you would be able to select from that menu. You could configure it so you could say, okay, at boot time, I want to choose this kernel or that kernel. But right now, by default, we are actually booting into the most update kernel in our system. And remember, you can always see this information by using the uname command on Linux. And uname-a will show me that my current running kernel is the 3.5.0-39 the generic kernel. So even though I have two available on my system, uh, this is the one I'm running. Remember that kernels have drivers associated with them, or modules in the case of the Linux kernel. And so those are actually going to be stored in the directory um, lib modules. So I'll go over there and I'll just leave this full screen so everything's kind of on one case, uh, one screen. And you'll notice that there are directories that correspond with the names of our um, compiled kernels. And so it's important to realize that every kernel um, has corresponding modules and those modules only correspond to a specific version of the kernel. So if you change kernel versions, you need to go ahead and change and recompile and have new modules that are compatible with that um, <coughs> with that new uh, kernel. So in this case, we can take a peek in this directory. And if I look in that 3.539 uh, directory, you'll notice that um, there's a bunch of different <coughs> files in here, but essentially if we dug around enough, we would find the actual kernel modules that we can load into um, our kernel. And in a previous lecture, I had discussed how that happens, but if you want to see what the installed kernel modules are, you can use lsmod. And this will show you all the modules that are currently installed into your running kernel. In most cases, 
you're going to go ahead and get your kernel updates through your distribution uh, distribution's main repositories. So in other words, you, you usually don't ever have to worry about building your own kernel. But there are, other t but there are times where you might need to do this, like uh, if you need to fix a problem with a driver or you are provided with um, you know, some customized hardware that uh, maybe you know, whatever the vendor does not have a release driver for you that you would need to build against uh, the specific version of the kernel that you're using. Um, there's a bunch of reasons you might just want to even try to do this yourself. So um, I will say that the normal path for uh, even building your own custom kernel is going to be to check with your distribution uh, through their website, see what the provider of your, of your Linux distribution recommends. Uh, Ubuntu has a really nice way that you can download all of the sources for your kernel using apt-get and you can build your own .deb file and manage your kernel installation the same way you would install and manage um, software using well, apt-get. So uh, in this case though what I want to do is I want to show you that you can actually go ahead and download the Linux uh, kernel source code and show you how to explore that source code and talk a little bit about um, you know what you find in there and uh, we will actually start into the configuration process for building a custom kernel, but we're not really going to go through the whole process of, of doing that. So the place you go to get your kernel uh, source code is at kernel.org, and this is the official location to download kernel sources. Again, you don't really need to do this because the maintainers of your distribution are already taking care of this. You'll see older versions of the kernel available, and you'll see um, upcoming release candidates for new versions, and um, basically... Um, it's good to know w what is a stable kernel. And again, you don't really want to go ahead and be changing uh, your kernel without really giving it a lot of research and thought. But for now, we're just going to explore. So I'm going to grab the latest stable kernel, and I'm going to save it um, to my desktop because I had already done this once before. So I will put my kernel sources on my desktop. And you're going to notice that it downloads a fairly large file. The kernel sources are... Uh, Last time I checked, about 72 megabytes from my previous download. Now that my kernel sources are downloaded, um, you'll notice that I've got a tar.exe file. So I'm going to go ahead and use tar to uncompress this. And in this case, I can just let tar figure out what the compression algorithm is and give it the name of the file, and it will go ahead and uncompress my kernel. It might take a little bit of time because we're going, um, it's about an 8 to 1 compression ratio. We're going from about 72 megs to around 600 megs of um, data the last time I did this. So it might take a little bit of time to get that prompt back. This would have been a good process to run in the background. Uh, but for now we can take a look and note that a lot of stuff is happening. And so what you realize is that there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot that goes uh, goes into uh, the source code that is the Linux kernel. When that's done, I've now got a folder. And in that folder is my uncompressed Linux sources. And I'm going to cd into that directory. And clear, and ls. And in this directory, you'll see a bunch of uh, other directories and files that give you some information about how to navigate around this. The most important one being the readme file. And it's important that you go and take a look at the readme file so you can see um, information about how to build the kernel, who maintains it, and information about uh, licenses and all other um, components. Uh, another, you know, it, it's basically the place to start. Awesome source. If you're curious about writing drivers or what source code to drivers looks like, um, the modules uh, within your kernel, you can go and dig around and start to look through some of these directories. So for example, if we go into the drivers directory, you'll notice that there are a number of other directories here that um, demonstrate um, or, or include information about all these different areas for where you could have various drivers. Uh, probably the best place to go, or what I was most interested in, um, was to take a look at some of the networking stuff, um, you know, and those would be in net. So if I cd into net, do an ls, and then from there I can go take a look at Ethernet drivers. So for me, taking a look at some of these network drivers is kind of interesting. And, you know, maybe you find like the network driver you have on your machine, and you can go ahead and learn some more about that. Definitely worth taking a look at some of these files. They're all written in C, and you get an idea of how uh, low-level drivers are written if you're interested. But these are all of the source code files. Um, 
Oh, cool. And I went right back up to where I wanted to be. So you get this ability to look around. Now, I want to go ahead and start the process for configuring the kernel because I want to get, I want you to try to get an appreciation for all of the things and all the knowledge that the kernel has built into it. So to do that, we're going to jump into what's called the configuration menu. And the configuration menu is how you tell the kernel, if you were to create a new one, uh, what information it should um, have built into it. In other words, what knowledge uh, is built directly into the kernel, what uh, various drivers should be loaded as modules. So in other words, what information does the kernel need to load um, just in time to use a certain resource. Uh, and you get to see all the different things that it can do. On Ubuntu, there's a few things that we need to do uh, to get this set up. If you don't have it already installed, I'm going to actually utilize what's called NCurses, or the basic menu config to demonstrate some of the features that the kernel has. Um, if you don't already have it installed, um, the package to install is called lib ncurses 5 dash dev. And in my case, I already have it installed. Uh, but if you do not have it installed, it would go through and install the dependencies that are necessary. So the reason why I'm able to demonstrate what I'm about to demonstrate is because I've installed the ncurses library. There are other ways to do this that, that can manage using X windows. Um, but in, with this specific build of Ubuntu that I'm using and the virtual machine I'm using, I was having trouble with those. So I'm going to use this as a way to demonstrate what the kernel can do. So while I am in the kernel source directory, I am going to run the command make menu config. And what this is going to do is go ahead and do some compiling of things. And by the time this is done, what it should do is present me with a, um, a text-based GUI uh, system, which is really what NCurses provides, that allows me to go through and select and deselect and options that I want installed into my kernel. Or if I would like to have modules installed, uh, I can install them as or, or have certain pieces installed as modules. So I'm not going to do too much more beyond this. But what I would like to do is just quick demonstrate that when I jump into this configuration menu, it shows you all the things that the, the kernel um, has information about. And so a really good place to start looking is if I scroll down here, you'll notice that one of the uh, selection options here is file systems. And I think this is a really great place to just kind of talk a little bit about what the kernel does and things that it and services that it provides. So I'm going to use the arrows to go down to that. I'm going to hit enter to select it. And what you're going to notice is in this sub menu is that there are a number of file systems that the Linux system can support. And you'll notice that any time, if, if, for example, the operating system needs to read uh, a disk that you plug into it, uh, that file system that is on that disk needs to be understood by the system. And the kernel has knowledge built in. If we look for ext2, 3, 4, um, uh, riserfs, and a bunch of other things, jfs, and if you scroll down, you'll notice lots and lots of file systems, xfs, uh, btrfs, and so on, lots of file systems. Um, if there was a new file system or a file system that was not included in the kernel, you know, uh, you would be able to go ahead and add those source code files, uh, build those modules, or build those directly into the kernel yourself. It's something that you could add um, by, I guess, patching the kernel source tree, which totally is beyond the um, scope of this. But in this case, you can kind of per, uh, review what items are available um, for you to... Um, you know, what type of disks you can read. And one of the items all the way at the bottom is DOS FAT NT file system. So I'm going to hit enter there. And what you'll notice is the reason why my Linux system can interact with uh, disks that are formatted on a Windows system is because the kernel has information about how to interact with uh, FAT systems and DOS systems. And you'll notice that it even has um, read support for NTFS. Notice that write support for NTFS is off. Uh, as far as I know, still to this day, Linux can read NTFS, but not write to it. A couple other things to point out while we're in this menu is you'll notice that MS-DOS support, there's a letter M there. So if I hit the space bar, that turns to a star. And if I hit it again, it, there's nothing there. And if I hit it again, I go back to module. This allows me, when I'm configuring my kernel, to load that knowledge into the kernel as a module. So only load it into the kernel when it's needed, if there's an M there. If there's a star there, it will only load that, it, or I'm sorry, it will always have information about how to read uh, a kernel uh, embedded into it. And if there's nothing there, then the kernel has no idea how to interac interact with MS-DOS disks. Um, there's really not a huge hit between having something loaded as a module or um, embedded directly in the kernel. 
Um, so it's really up to you and just about if you don't think you're going to be using DOS disks all the time, but there's like that one rare occasion where you might use it, uh, you know, maybe a module is the best way to go. Uh, I'm going to use the right arrow key to select exit and hit enter to go back up a level, hit exit again and go back up a level. And you'll notice I can do a bunch of stuff in here. I can, and I would encourage you to kind of just look through here. Um, it's pretty easy to, um, the first time you start to build your own kernels to break things because you'll be like, oh, I'll try this and not realize that that's dependent on something else or whatever. Um, but I encourage you to definitely walk through this. And I, and I think this, I like to do this. And then the reason why I'm doing this in this video lecture is just kind of show you that, wow, the kernel has a lot of knowledge of a lot of hardware systems. So definitely take some time to look through this menu, look through the things that it can support. When you're done, you can use the right arrow to exit. In this case, I'm going to save it first. It will save a file called .config. Uh, hit exit, and then I will exit out of this menu. And if I look, it's now created a file in my directory called .config. And if we look at that file, the file contains all of the settings for my kernel so that when I would go to compile a new kernel, um, it would use this file to figure out what should and shouldn't be um, created, and, or I'm sorry, included in that kernel build. How do you build a kernel? Well, making sure I'm in that directory. Once I've run make menu config, you're going to run make all, which would go ahead and compile the kernel. And that can take a while, depending on um, the speed of your system. When you've made everything and everything is built, all your modules and um, your kernel itself, uh, you can run make modules install, which will copy your modules over to the appropriate folder in lib modules and then you can do uh, make install to install your kernel and after you've done that you'll need to go edit your bootloader so that it's aware of the new kernel and knows uh, that it's there and then you can try to reboot your system and see that if you've built a good kernel really long process goal of this lecture definitely download the linux source code take a look at the code that's written in there Take some time to run the, the config, menu config, uh, and look through the different things that the kernel knows about. Uh, again, you can know pretty much everything about a Linux system. Um, everything that the kernel knows, you can know. Uh, there shouldn't be any mysteries as a Linux, Linux administrator. You should be able to know every file on your system, why it's there, everything that the kernel you have installed supports. Um, these are achievable things, uh, and I think that those make for secure systems as well.